couple of things that, that have to do with our Christmas season around here. I mean, we are celebrating it big. This will be the best season we've ever had. I just believe that. I know it. I feel it. And we're doing great. If you have the day off tomorrow and you can help us decorate, we are going to decorate like we've never decorated before. We have a whole new scene, a whole new set, and we need hands that can help us through this process. So if you could be here at 930 and get part of our team and, and help us uh, turn this place into a great thing that uh, honors the Lord, plus just helps us celebrate the greatest birthday ever on the face of the planet. So be here tomorrow at 930. We would appreciate that. Uh, Becky tells me, and she is our women's ministry uh, leader here. She's on our team as women's ministry leader. It's part of her portfolio. And that you have the women's ministry uh, simply Christmas thing this Friday. And she says she needs people to sign up and let them know about their kids because we are we need to get um, child care for your children. But if you don't sign up and you come anyway with kids, and there's nobody to take care of your kids and you're mad at the church because you didn't sign up. That's the truth. Sign up and go out back here in the back, get your ticket. It's going to be a great night. Well, everybody on in America knows about the wise men. If you're an atheist, you hate the wise men. You don't want that camel on anybody's lawn, especially a government entity. You don't want those wise men and their gifts anywhere close to you. You don't believe they exist, but it makes you so mad that everybody else does. If you're a Buddhist, you know about the wise men. It, it, whatever religion you may or the world may have, uh, our world here in America, they know about the wise men. But if you were here a couple weeks ago, we started our Christmas series, and we were talking about this, that the wise men, when they met Jesus, they went a different way. They didn't stay the same. So let me kind of preview it, and then we'll get into today talking about the journey of faith. Every person here that has Jesus in your heart, Jesus set you free. Say yes. He set you free. And what he set you free from was misery and hell. And he set you free from addictions and set you free from the struggles. And, and it doesn't mean we don't have to fight the fight of faith. And so for today's message, I wanted us all to let you know that if I point or stand in this circle right here between these two papers, this area is hell this is hell this area here is the blessing everybody understand that some of you didn't say yes this is hell and this is the blessing everybody understand that okay so when you understand that now here's what i'm talking about the wise men they left they followed the star they found jesus and when they found jesus they didn't go back the same way but I have experienced, and some of you are doing this right now, and it's time for you to get out of hell and for finally get out of hell and get into heaven. So you go back and forth. You're, you, you, you get in this thing, and, 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 and oh, and then you go back, oh, and some of you go out of church, into the world, back into the church. Oh, God, help me. A year later, you're in here, and you're back there. And I've watched it my whole ministerial life, and I'm just here to tell you this right now. I'm going to be flat honest with you today. Why would I be dishonest? But this is going to be down and dirty. We're going to wrestle in the mud. It's time for some of you to get out of that thing once and for all. Yeah. And, and, and I'm going to explain why I believe some of you stay in there and how you can stay out. But what causes us to go back? I believe that if you are not on a journey of faith, you will go back to the place that is familiar to you. Because a journey of faith is taking you a different way. You will not go back once you've met Jesus. And, and, and this is a bold statement here. Some of you might have met the Jesus that you think will keep you out of hell. That's called fire insurance. And if you've met Jesus for fire insurance, you'll have a tendency to go back there. But once you meet him, I mean, fall in love. Oh, head over heels over him. You don't want anything else. And you're not going to be happy there. You're going to be miserable there. So quit being miserable and let's get in to the happy place. The place that we call the, capital T, capital H, capital E, blessing, capital B, L-E-S-S-I-N-G, the blessing. You see, everybody walks faith. Whether you're a believer or not, you're in faith. If you're an atheist, you, by faith, are believing that God doesn't exist. 
I mean, it's faith to be an atheist. I think it takes a lot of faith to be an atheist. Because if you're wrong, whew, that was the greatest mistake of your life. You see, if we're wrong, all we did was have a great life. But if we're right, poor pity that person. It doesn't matter if you're agnostic, atheist, everybody's on a journey of faith. You wake up in the morning, you believe that your car is going to start. That's a journey of faith. Some of you, that's like real faith. You don't know, should I get in this car or walk on water? But whatever. You know, did you know that, that the wise men were on a journey of faith? That Noah was on a journey of faith. You talk about faith. Hey, build a boat, a giant boat. Even though it's never rained ever in the history of the world, you build a boat. That's faith. David killed Goliath on faith. Hey, I'll fight the guy and I'll do it with rocks. Okay, that's faith. And we can go through every apostle and everybody in the Bible and, and, and the great believers that we've had in our lifetime. And you, everybody's on a journey of faith. So the question is, how can you get out of that and into this on a continual basis so that you live in the blessing that God has called you to live in? And we're going to answer that. So let's dig into the scriptures. The first scripture is from the wise men. And when the wise men, when they saw the star, okay, they take off a year ago. They've been on a year on this journey. They say it took them a year to go from Iran to the place in Bethlehem. And when they saw the star land over where Jesus was, it says that they were overjoyed. And for those of you who memorized it in the King James Version, they were overjoyed with exceeding great joy. Because they met Jesus and when you, some of you came to Jesus, you were so happy. I came to Jesus. Hallelujah. Many of us have rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Now, here's the next one. It's one of our key scriptures here in our, in our church. And it's in Hebrews 11.6. I memorize it. I try to get you guys to memorize it. I've probably used it in scriptures a hundred times. And it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So faith pleases God. So when you're on a journey of faith, you're pleasing God. God now the second half of this scripture let's get yourself out of yourself and know that God wrote this I didn't God made this up I didn't I'm not telling you something that God didn't say and here it is because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him did you know that God doesn't say, I reward those who are in and out and in and out? There is no reward for that. Not that we're working for rewards. I didn't make this up. God's the one that put this in the book. He rewards those who diligently and earnestly seek him. You cannot earnestly seek God from a place of hell. The only way you can get in when you're in there is to earnestly seek God has helped me get out. Now, before we go to the next scripture, let's talk about the foundation of this scripture. Everybody here probably knows or probably has seen a picture of the Wailing Wall. If you don't know what the Wailing Wall is, if you see a picture of Jerusalem, you've all seen it on the news at times. And, and, and in my mind, I've probably seen it a thousand times or more, and you've probably seen it more than me or, or as much as I have. And that's where there's a wall in Jerusalem where they have all these people praying and they have their little cap on and they're praying like this. And then they're taking their prayers and they're sticking them in this wall. That's called the Wailing Wall. Now that wall has been there for 3,000 years. So I'm going to show you how that wall came about. It came about in 2 Samuel 24, 24. And David was going to make a sacrifice to the Lord because David had messed up. And he goes to this guy. There's his name, Aruna. And he, and, and he says, Aruna, I want to buy this piece of property and I'm going to build an altar to God. And Aruna says, no, I'll just give it to you for free because I, I want to be part of your celebration. And then here's David's answer. No. I insist on paying for it because I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. 
So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen and paid 50 shekels of silver for them. And that is where that piece of property is where Solomon built the temple and where the wailing wall exists today. So now you know some history. That happened because David took the walk of faith and he refused to let anybody rob him of his blessing. Are you there? He refused to let anybody rob him of his blessing. And when you go there, you're allowing somebody, something to rob you of your blessing. So how do we stay out of that hole? Take your notes out. And there's three steps to the step of journey, to the journey of faith, excuse me. Any wise person's journey requires a journey of faith because faith is alive. It is a risk. It will take you out of your comfort zone. We all love our comfort zone. Some of you sit in the same spot every week. And I'm glad you sit there because that way I know if you're not here or not. And why do you sit there? Because that's your comfort zone. You, some of you sit in the back, you like it. Some of you sit in the front, you like it. It's your comfort. Some people get here early so they can get the front. Some people get there early so they can get the back. I'm not telling you where to sit. It's your comfort zone. We like the people around us. For some reason, we like this spot, makes us feel good. Maybe we can escape. We don't have to talk to people. And you said to talk to 13 people, and you didn't want to, but you had to today. But your comfort zone keeps you with the people that you like. I mean, we sleep on all of us i'm here I, I i assume you have a bed we all have a bed i have a bed and and you know you can keep a bed a long time you know why because you're comfortable in that bed and you're afraid if you get another bed it won't be as comfortable you know you need to get another bed but you like your comfort zone i mean we have a comfort zone in, in restaurants i have a comfort zone in restaurants there's sometimes that i just need a piece of pizza sometimes i just need some wings and sometimes i need a hamburger that's just me and there's days i wake up and i say i gotta have some wings and when I say I got to have some wings, I go to the place that I feel comfortable with the wings because I like the wings, right? That's the comfort zone. I have my place for hamburger. I have my place for pizza. I don't like any other places, although I'll go. I like to try different things, but back to comfort zone. Let's get back in the zone. We like our comfort zone. We like our friends. And some of your friends are really miserable and really bad friends, but you're comfortable with them. Even though Jesus wants you to go farther, you like these people that are stuck here. So that's why I really believe that anybody who's not on a great walk of faith will always go back to what they're comfortable with. I'm going to say that again. Anybody who is not on a great walk of faith will always go back to the comfort zone that they feel comfortable with, even though this is miserable. And they know they shouldn't be here. At least I know it. But when you take the walk of faith, it will always take you out of the zone. It will always be a risk because God has got great things for us. Listen, things that you can't imagine. And so when you're walking towards what you can't imagine, it scares you at times. So you go back to your comfort zone. Now, number two, you got to take a walk of faith. And then second of all, a wise person's journey is one of worship. Worship always involves sacrifice. David said, I will not give anything to my God unless it costs me something. And there's three things that true worship has to have. It has to have your wealth, has to have your will, and has to have your wonder. So let me kick it off. It has to have your wealth. Some of you have struggled with this and struggled with this and struggled with this. You such struggle that to where you rob yourself. And the reason you struggle is because you're afraid, really. You don't really believe. You don't really believe that God's got better things for you. So... I talk about it, and, and, and this is not a tithing moment, but some of you can't tithe to save your soul because you're afraid that God won't supply your need. That's the truth. If you really believe God would supply your need and he would bless you abundantly, you would give like crazy. Can I tell you that you look at all these gifts here, and, and we're just beginning. I think we're about 150. We got another 350 that have come down here. This is going to be so great, but you look at that, and, and if this is 150, I believe it is because I counted before service. I've been counting when people come in. That value there is four thousand five hundred dollars right there that's wealth that you decided to spend for a poor person that's what god asks he says listen i don't and and i've been in a pastor for all these years can i tell you i've never heard of god telling anybody to give him all 
Some of you are afraid. Oh, God might have me give it all. No, he doesn't. If he has you give it all, then he's got to feed you. If he asks you to give it all, he's got to find an apartment for you because you can't afford it. God doesn't want to feed you and give you an apartment. He says, give me 10% and give some more to the poor and you can live on the rest and I'll bless you. That's the worship of God. But some of you will struggle. But some of you, it's time to get off the love, get into the love boat, man. Let's get on the love train. Come on. Now your will. We are people who don't like anybody telling us what to do. Come on, church. I don't care who you are. You don't want anybody telling you what to do. I've been married 45 years, and I can't stand my wife telling me what to do, even if she's right. You'd figure I'd get over it. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. And, 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 and it's a struggle, and we have this will. We have this thing inside of us that, that even when you come to church, the preacher tells you something, you know I'm right, or who's ever speaking, you know they're right, but it makes you mad. Because they're telling you what to do. We, uh, Thursday, my wife and I are flying to Las Vegas. We've been looking for a youth pastor here for six months or more. We haven't found one. I've got a lot of resumes. And I've interviewed a lot of people. And they keep coming. And we keep advertising. And they keep coming. Hopefully this Thursday is a bingo. So pray about it. But, if it, but, but every person I've interviewed, every person, I tell them this. When you come to work for me, and for this church, there's three things that have to happen. One, you will not drink alcohol if you work for Crosswinds. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about working here. You will not drink. And sometimes they, hmm. I say, two, you will be a tither if you come here. You're not taking anybody's money. To pay your salary if you're not a tither as a pastor of this church. Can you do that? Mm, sometimes they have a big audience. I'm going to do the same thing on Thursday. And I say, number three, you will not attend another church except for this church unless you're on vacation and you decide to. This is your church. You won't get in a small group in another church. You won't go. This is your church. If you're taking money from us, you will not drink. You will tithe. And this will be your church. Can you live with that? If you can, then we can talk further. If you can't, let's just have lunch and we'll go on. Obviously, we don't have a youth pastor yet. Why? Because there's, it just bristles us when somebody tells us what we can and cannot do. And until you get over that, you will never experience the blessing of God. Because God knows exactly what you need to do. And he will tell you, but you have to receive and obey. And then finally, I had to add a fourth one, and, and it's this one. I already told the guy that, that we're going down to see that you're not going to come here and try to change this to where you've been. If, if, if where you were at was so good, then you should have stayed there. But you're not going to come here and change this because we have our own mission. This is what we do here. And so, anyway, you think, you think what does that have to do with me? Because we're just the same. We're just the same. But if we're ever going to be and experience the greatness of God, we've got to give up our wealth. We have to give up our will. And we've got to give up our wonder. And we all have wonder, especially those of us who have raised kids. And if, if you've raised kids, you know exactly what I'm telling you is truth. If you haven't raised kids, this wonder is not part of your life yet. And, and maybe you won't ever have kids. And if you don't, don't worry, because this wonder will never be part of your life. But here's a wonder. I don't care how old your kids. We wonder if they're doing right. We wonder if they're going to be all right. We wonder if they're going to be safe. We wonder if they're going to not do something stupid. Well, they're always going to do something stupid so you can get over that. Because you always do something stupid, and they're your children. So that's the way it goes. But when you are on the journey of faith, you have to give it to the Lord. Now, I'm not saying you don't worry. I, I worry for mine. My son's 35, 6, 7, I don't know. I think, thank God I'm married because she keeps track of it. Every time she says, this is Trey's birthday. Well, how old is he? Oh, no kidding. Huh? Okay. And, uh, but, but I give him to the Lord. I'm not saying he's doing anything wrong. I just have to give him to the Lord. God, I pray for him every day. God, that's your child. And I know you're going to do great things for him. God, you're going to lead him in the right way, help him make good decisions. Boom. And then I can walk on. Otherwise, they sit around, ooh, 
and we wonder if God is true. We wonder if we tithe, if we're going to have any money. We wonder if, if somebody's not going to come along and take all we've got. We wonder if we're going to be healthy. We just wonder, 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 and we go through this process. But when you are walking the walk of faith and you have the walk of worship, you worship with your wealth, you worship with your will, and you worship with your wonder. Now, the third thing is, wise person's journey is one of change. A true encounter with the blessing changes things. It changes you. We need to start looking at ourselves and see how we treat ourselves. I have done so many counseling hours that, man, I can be certified four or five times over with all the counseling hours I've done. And I've come to a conclusion after all these years. And so let me tell you something that I found. That angry people, if they're angry with themselves, if they don't like themselves, they will, ang they will be angry with others. Does that make sense? See, if, 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 I, if Pete likes Pete, and Pete's happy with Pete, then hey, I can just be happy with you. But angry people who are not happy with themselves get just a slight moment of satisfaction when they criticize you. Does that make sense? It just makes them happy for just a little bit. But the problem is the next day they wake up and they have to look at themselves in the mirror one more time. And then they go through the cycle. I'm angry with you. I'm angry with somebody else. I'm blaming somebody else. My problems are because of you. My problems are because of the church. My problems are because of the pastor. My problems are because somebody didn't help me. My problems are because I was raised on the wrong side. My problem is my color. My problem is my job. My problem is my education. You can do whatever you want. But until you look at yourself and say, I got to treat myself better. You're going to struggle. And you're going to struggle with anger issues. Now, this isn't a, a sermon on how to lose weight. But I don't know about you. I go into this holiday season, and I've been doing it for years. So I'm 64. I started gaining weight around 35. I don't know when you did. But before, when I was 30 years old, I could eat anything, anytime, anywhere. Anybody like me out there? And all of a sudden, you hit 35, and you look in the mirror, and you say, where did this thing come from? I do this every single year. So this year, I did it. Same thing. I said, okay, I'm going to go into the holiday season, and I'm going to be in moderation. I'm not going to blow it. And when I step on the scales after this Thanksgiving week, and see, I spent 10 days in L.A., three days at Disneyland with the grandkids, and then I spent another six days with my family down there and 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 i said i'm gonna do it in moderation and i'm gonna be so happy and i even fooled myself i'd get up every morning and 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 i would get up, i get up at dark time and i'm the only person in the whole house getting up and i look at myself in the mirror and i say i don't think i've gained any weight and i actually told my wife i said i think i haven't gained any weight i think i'm doing real good so thanksgiving day comes and i'm just like you we eat the turkey we eat the gravy we eat the stuffing we eat the mashed potatoes we eat the dressing. We eat a salad. We do that. And then our family is a pie family. So I ate a piece of chocolate cream pie. Then pumpkin pie. Because it was Thanksgiving. And then we got a berry pie with homemade whipped cream. And then we topped it off with some coconut surprise cake. And I sat down after that to finish watching the last of the ball games on TV. And I thought to myself, what have you done? <laughs> and then I got up the next day and stepped on the scale. All good intentions. And I lied to myself the whole time. I lied. I think I'm maintaining my weight. Telling my wife. I'm doing good. Sorry about you. <laughs> I'll tell you this. She was in last time. I didn't say this, but she stepped on the scales. And she, two days later, she told me, man, I didn't want to make you feel bad, but I didn't gain a pound. I wanted to slap the fire out of you. <laughs> now, we're having fun, and we're talking about this, and, and we're going to be done in six minutes. But 
you, you do something like that, and you can get over it, and you can get back on your plan, and, and, and you can step on the scale every day if that's your gig, you know. If there's another neurotic person, I'm so glad you're part of our church, but that's another story. And, but it would be ludicrous for me the next night to eat four pieces of pie. And it would be ludicrous for the night after that, and the night after that, and the night after that, and the, it wouldn't, nobody, nobody here would do that. But what is more ludicrous is that you sit in the place of blessing and we go over here into the hell of four pieces of pie and we come back and then we decide to go back and then we go back and you think, I, uh, okay, I'm okay today. And then we go, oh, I better be over here. And then on Sunday, oh, no, no, I'm over here. God forgive me. And then on Friday, oh, and it's the crate. It's nuts. That's not what God has for you. God has a great life for you. Goodness and mercy is what God has for you. Abundance and prosperity is what God has for you. And health. But you've got to be willing to have a walk of faith, a walk of change. Okay, you've got to have a walk of change. And you've got to have this walk of worship. And so let's button it up with your notes. Three things. One. If you are in Christ and you have turned back to your old ways, stop and follow and return by a different way. You know, all of us, and, and maybe you haven't, but most of us here have messed up and gone back to our old ways once in a while. And, and I'm not saying that's good. Sometimes we need to go back there and, and realize how ugly it was, so we decide to stay out of it. But if you're here today and you're back in that hole, get out. In fact, pull up your pants, put your belt on, and start walking like an adult that loves Jesus. You're not a child anymore. We're going to get down and dirty and wrestle for a minute. You're not a child anymore. You are, well, you say, well, I'm still 18. No, you're an adult. Pick it up. You're not a child. Get out of that and get into a different route. Second of all, that if you have never met Jesus, know that God loves you enough to come to earth and have a relationship with you. You've come to a good place. I'm going to ask you if you want to accept Jesus in two minutes. God loves you, and he called you to this church. And in the last service, we had about seven people give their heart to the Lord. Four of them were visitors. Thank God. That's what we're about here. We want to win people to Jesus, disciple them, and we want to have a great mission. But if that's you, it's time, man. It's time. God's got a great plan for you. And thirdly, wise people are increasing every day, and wise men and women still seek him. And I trust that today, if you haven't started, you will jump on the journey of faith. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, let there be an anointing right now in the name of Jesus upon this place. I pray that you touch every man, every woman, every child, every person in here, every person that was in our last night's service, every person in the first service this morning, everyone, Lord God, that we won't walk out of here and say, boy, that was fine, let's go eat. We will walk out of here and say, you know what? I need to get on the journey of faith. I got out of that, and I got to get back in. Or some of you who've been on it would say, boy, that was good. I'm still going. God, I know you have more for me. But if you are here and you don't know if you're going to go to heaven or hell, if you die tonight, I'm going to look at the left section, left center. Then I'm going to look at the video. And then the center, right center, and then the right. And I'm going to ask you this question. If you want to give your heart to Christ, look me right in the eye. And I'll say thank you very much. You can put your head down. And after we look across this audience and people look up, I'm going to say a prayer. You in the church repeat it after me asking Jesus to come into your heart. So left side, Pastor Pete, pray for me. Yes, ma'am, I'll pray for you all the way through here. Thank you so very much. Left center, Pastor Pete, pray for me. I want to join those that looked up already. Thank you very much. Now, if you're watching right now on the video, I want to tell you, I can't see you, but God sees you. God sees all the way through that lens. And if you want to give your heart to the Lord, as, as we repeat this player, prayer, I want you to repeat it to yourself. But right now, I'm looking at you. You can look right at the camera, right at your video, whatever you're looking it on, and God is going to see you. Now, right center, Pastor Pete, pray for me. I want to join those. Rededicate your life. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. And right side, Pastor Pete, pray for me. Give my heart to Christ. Thank you very much. Now, if you looked up to accept Christ or you're on the uh, 
video right now, you're watching it live, let me just tell you something. The Lord's got a plan for your life. Repeat this prayer. And church, let's help them. Dear Lord Jesus, I confess I'm a sinner. I ask you to come into my heart and forgive me for my sin. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. With your help, from this day forward, I will live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you looked up to accept Christ or your visitor here, let me introduce you to Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave, say everybody say hi, Dave. He's our pastor of our, our connection, and so he'll help you get connected to our church. There's out those doors what we call the hub. Dave's going to be there with his team. And if you gave your heart to Christ, please go see him. We've got a Bible. We have some gifts for you. If you uh, are new to the church, he'd love to take you for a tour, or somebody would love to take you for a tour, show you around the building, see what's going on. This is a great church. You are great people, and we're glad you're here. We are kingdom builders. So, for those of you who are newer or you missed the last two weeks are wondering, what are these presents doing up here? We have adopted one of our schools, Agnes Risley, which is less than a mile that way, right over there. That school has... 99% uh, poverty level. That means out of 500 students, only five are not in poverty. The other 495 are poverty stricken. And our goal is to create a bridge over to that school and those families and get them to cross the bridge over to Jesus Christ. We start by loving people. John Maxwell put this way, you always got to touch a heart before you ask for a hand. So every single one of those right now gifts has a name tag on it. And so we had you in the last two weeks take the name tags. As an aside, listen up real close. 17 of you did not register your tags. Pastor Jose is, or, okay. Who's that, Doris? Okay, Jocelyn. Yeah, Jocelyn is back there. And she is right, right there. She'll be out front. Please see her and say, oh, I'm one of those that took the tags. We can't go to that school with not with somebody not getting a present. Can you say amen? Everybody's got to have a present. Now, if you didn't get a chance to give and you want to, I'm going to tell you, I'm not taking an offering for this. We are tithers, and we tithe. So if you're not, an, if you're not a tither of Crossroads yet, get on the tithe boat and get in where God wants you to be. Get your finances aligned. But we also, I made an executive decision. We're not just bringing these gifts to the kids. We want to bless every school teacher over there with a $50 gift certificate. So there's around 30 of them. We're going to give them all a card with 50 bucks. And not only that, we're going to bless all the principal, the principal, the vice principal, and all the custodians, and all the assistants. But they don't get as much as the teacher. We're going to give them 25 bucks just because we want teachers to know you are important to us. So if you want to give in the offering above your tithe and say for a school teacher or an assistant or something, put the money in there and uh, we're going to get it. So we're excited about this this year. Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us in financial abundance. We are a great, great people because you are great and you have made us great and we get to be your hand extended in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you as you give. Let's watch the...